When looking at a map of northern Ohio, around the city of Cleveland, references to the Western Reserve begin to appear in the names of several parks, buildings, and institutions, most notably Case Western Reserve University. But why is that? What is the Western Reserve exactly? And why does that name appear around northern Ohio specifically? This goes all the way back to 1662 with a charter granted to the colony of Connecticut by King James II, stating that the colony should run from the said Narragansett Bay on the east to the South Sea on the west, with the South Sea being an older name for what is now the Pacific Ocean, meaning that in alternate history, the small state of Connecticut could have been a bicoastal state. However, this vision was stopped by the practicalities of the world at the time, with much of that territory eventually being claimed by rebel nations such as England, France, and Spain, as well as other US states, not to mention the thousands of different Native American tribes that already lived on the land. However, despite all these challenges, Connecticut was able to maintain ownership of this large area of land along the southern banks of Lake Erie, known as the Connecticut Western Reserve. During the American Revolution, the British Army initiated a series of raids along the Connecticut coast, setting fire to thousands of buildings, including many food warehouses, homes, and churches, in several towns across the state including Danbury, New Haven, Fairfield, Norwalk, and most notably New London in 1781. New London is a mid-sized New England town, but its deep water port and its location at the mouth of the Thames River made it an important trade city during the colonial period, with much of New England's early mercantile history being built on shipping beaver pelts back to England. However, as new trade routes emerged, and as much of New England's forests slowly gave way to farmlands, by the 1700s New London had become an important stop on the West Indies trade between England, New England, and the Caribbean, with New England shipping salted beef, pork, and fish to the West Indies in exchange for sugar grown on plantations worked by African slaves. This sugar would then be sent to England, where it would be traded for finished goods, such as glass, metal tools, and cloth. However, a thriving black market also developed in many New England ports as a way for merchants to bypass the high taxes set by the British government on the American colonies. And with the start of the American Revolution, interrupting the West Indies trade, the Continental Congress allowed many of these now unemployed merchants to become legal pirates, or privateers, allowing them to attack and steal from British ships to further disrupt the trade routes between the Americas and England, with New London becoming an important center of American piracy during the war. However, in an attempt to crack down on these pirates, as well as to hurt the American cause, the British sent an army to attack New London in 1781, with the commander leading the British army being the traitor, Benedict Arnold, who had been a general in the American army before he betrayed them by joining the British. This betrayal hurt even more for the Connecticut residents, whose homes were now being burned because Arnold was also a local, having been born and raised in the neighboring town of Norwich. After the war, the families who had lost their homes began petitioning the government for some financial assistance in order to rebuild their lives. This led half a million acres of the Western Reserve to be set aside for these families in the 1790s, becoming known as the Firelands or the Sufferers Lands, with the eastern part of the reserve being sold off to the Connecticut Land Company in order to raise money for the Connecticut school system, with one of the largest investors in the company, Moses Cleveland, going on to lead an expedition to survey much of the land, with one of the settlements he founded eventually becoming the present-day city of Cleveland, Ohio. However, for all those families that had lost their homes in the fires, it took decades for all the claims to be processed, with 1,870 claims eventually being recognized by the government. And it wasn't until after the War of 1812, 31 years after the burning of New London, that many of these families and their descendants were able to move out west to the Firelands to claim the land for themselves, with the area now being part of the modern-day state of Ohio, with several families that didn't want to move out west choosing to sell the land claims to other settlers instead. With there being so many settlers from Connecticut and northern Ohio that for a short time this area was even known as New Connecticut, with many of these new western settlements being named after their hometowns back in Connecticut, leading there to be several towns across Ohio with Connecticut town names, such as New Haven, Norwalk, Danbury, and even New London. Now, the Western Reserve wasn't the only place settlers from Connecticut end up moving to over the centuries, with there being a significant migration of people from Connecticut to other nearby states, such as New York, Pennsylvania, and most notably Vermont, which had so many settlers from Connecticut that it even became known as New Connecticut for a short time. And as noted by Professor Walt Woodward, the official Connecticut state historian from 2004 to 2020, there were several environmental, social, political, as well as religious factors that would have pushed the residents of Connecticut to move out west during the early 1800s. Now, the same transformation of Connecticut's wilderness from beaver country into large tracts of farmable land also allowed the state's population to grow immensely during the 1700s. 
But in the 1800s, this desire for land was also one of the main factors pushing people out west, with many established Connecticut families facing difficulties on how to best divide up their land claims amongst their descendants. They could divide up their lands into smaller and smaller pieces with each generation. This would make sure every descendant had an inheritance. But over a few generations, further dividing up smaller and smaller pieces of land would eventually make the land claims so small that they would eventually be worthless. They could also attempt to preserve the value of the land by passing it on to just one or two family members, but this would leave the rest of the family without an inheritance, with this increased competition for land also being exacerbated by the arrival of newer immigrants who also wanted some land for their families. And this push to move out west was further intensified by a period of climate change in the early 1810s, with a drop in global temperatures destroying thousands of crops and ruining hundreds of farms across New England, with 1816 becoming known as the year without a summer due to the dark skies and cold weather that lasted the entire year. But this desire for land also had a strong political component to it. Because before reforms were made in 1818, in order for men to vote in Connecticut, they also had to be property owners. So by not being able to own any land, it led many male citizens to also be politically disenfranchised and unable to participate in local government. And these tensions only increased as new political and religious movements began to emerge in the early 1800s in America. Today, even though we understand there to be a distinction between the government and religion in the US, due to the separation of church and state, that was not really the case in the early United States, with the Congregational Church being the established state church of Connecticut until 1818, with the local government funding the church and its clergy through taxing all of its citizens, regardless if they themselves were members of the church. And in addition to politics, the church also played an important role in the state's educational system, with Connecticut's most prominent school, Yale College, being founded by congregational ministers back in the early 1700s, with much of Connecticut's establishment being made up of wealthy merchants and traders, members of the congregational church, and graduates of Yale College, and often all three. After the founding of the United States, many of these officials aligned themselves with the Federalist Party, led by Alexander Hamilton which supported a strong federal government and was focused on growing America's industry through business and trade. But then, around the early 1800s, the United States experienced a religious revival known as the Second Great Awakening, which led several Christian denominations, such as the Baptists and the Methodists, to eventually become some of the largest Protestant movements in the country. And along with this religious shift, there was also a political one. With the Democratic-Republican Party becoming increasingly popular especially during this time among farmers in the North and settlers out West, Led by Thomas Jefferson, the party was seen as the main rivals of the Federalists due to their support for stronger state governments and their interest in growing America's agricultural industry. So, if you are a landless resident of Connecticut, a member of the Democratic Republican Party, or belong to the growing Methodist or Baptist churches, you would have been largely excluded from the established political and religious order presented by the Congregationalist Church and the Federalist Party, making the choice to move out west in the Western Reserve not just a way to get access to new land, but a path to increase political representation, as well as religious freedom. But at the same time, several of the most prominent political figures in the early history of Ohio also came from important Connecticut families themselves. For example, Samuel Huntington, the third governor of Ohio, his uncle slash adopted father, who was also named Samuel Huntington, had been a founding father and the Federalist governor of Connecticut. Return J. Meigs Jr. succeeded Huntington as the fourth governor of Ohio, and was the son of Return J. Meigs Sr., who had been a soldier in the American Revolution. And the seventh governor of Ohio, Ethan Allen Brown, studied law under Federalist leader Alexander Hamilton before moving out west to start a legal career, rising to become a justice on the Ohio Supreme Court before being elected governor. However, as opposed to their Federalist families back in Connecticut, all these officials were members of the Democratic Republican Party, with the first nine governors of Ohio belonging to that party. I hope this video has helped people better understand the history of Connecticut and Ohio. Please let me know what you think, and if there's anything I missed or other factors you think were important, please feel free to include them in the comments below. If you'd like to have early access and give feedback on this type of content, please consider joining the Patreon. As always, thanks to my patrons, Untroid and DC, who have helped me from the very beginning. Thanks for watching, and I hope to catch you next time.